Hello there and good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Polypharmacy Supporting the Pharmacist Workforce event uh, arranged by the Academic Health and Science Network in North Cumberland. Delighted to be here. I'm Waz back here and I'm a pharmacist like many of you. I, I work for NHS England, England and NHS Improvement on the Pharmacy Integration Programme, as well as the Columbia Healthcare. And lovely to be chairing today's event. There's not really any housekeeping here today. Um, I'm sure you all know where your toilets are and where your coffee stations are. Um, there's, there's some great work going on in the North East and Cumbria, some really, really innovative bits of work that pharmacy are leading on and really, really promoting. And today is really about showcasing some of, the, some of that work. Fantastic. And, you know, having, having read, read some of your work already to see the type, the type of stuff you're doing. Um, it's great to see the, the massive impact it's having on patients and patient care and improving safety for, for, the, for the people we look after. Um, and as, as well as doing all that work, which, you, which you're doing really well, uh, it's equally as important to share it and share it and network with your colleagues across the region and across and, and wider to, you know, so other people can take the benefits of your work, to take it and iterate it and, and adapt it with your own systems. So that's really good. So I thank you all for being here today. And for sharing the, the stuff you're doing. For the people who aren't presenting, I ask um, that you remain on mute so so our speakers are not interrupted. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, also, please please get engaged and 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 get involved. So ask questions. Use the chat function on the on the Teams app. Um, ask questions. We'll be looking at the questions and we'll try and answer them um, throughout the um, throughout the day. At the end of each presentation, we'll be able to give speakers a few, a few um, uh, minutes to answer any, uh, the key questions. Um, very shortly, um, if I can have the programme up, that'd be great to uh, people can see what's going on. But um, right, we'll begin in a few minutes. Um, just to say, just one, just the final thing for me is, if you are listening to your speakers and you're thinking this is really good, I could do this, then please do go go back to your organization and see how you can adapt some of this really good work to your own setting to your own organization and see how, how you can develop that um okay so before we we launch into a series of presentations uh, showcasing some of the work that's been going on um we will we'll have a keynote speaker i'm delighted to invite uh, or welcome uh, Dr. Bruce Warner, Deputy Chief Pharmacist at um, NHS England and NHS Improvement, to to uh, to the meeting today. It's a shame, Bruce, that you know you you can't be here in person because we I know that um, you're an excellent university graduate. Um, so it's been great to welcome you back up to your old stomping ground. But but we are where we are. So there's a lot going on in pharmacy, and and Bruce today is going to run through. The, all the stuff that we're involved with in nationally and maybe give you a little bit of a taste of what's coming as well. So um, over to you Bruce, thank you. Thanks Waz. Um, good afternoon everybody and uh, as Waz said under normal circumstances it would have been lovely to have uh, been back up in the northeast. As Waz said I studied in Sunderland and uh, never miss an opportunity to come back to the northeast. I love it up there. So um, I'm really delighted and, and uh, honoured that you've asked me to come and speak to you this afternoon. Um, I'm not going to take too long. Um, there's far more important speakers than, than me to come and some really exciting speakers looking at the programme. But hopefully what I can do is um, just give you a flavour of what's happening nationally, what the what the sort of key priorities are nationally, a lot of which you'll be aware of. Um, but hopefully we can just sort of give you a flavour on, on what's uh, what's vexing us, keeping us awake at night uh, at a national level. But of course, the uh, the important work is what's happening um, out there uh, with yourselves, with colleagues um, actually doing the work day to day. So if I could have the next slide, please. And the next one, thank you. 
So I thought it was worth just spending um, a couple of minutes just um, going through the, the the national leadership team. And some of you will be familiar with many of these names. Um, but Keith Ridge, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, heads up a team of uh, people working um, within NHS England and NHS Improvement, but also sort of uh, in associated organisations. <clears throat> so there's myself, um, and Richard Cattell, who act as deputies to Keith Ridge. I tend to concentrate on uh, primary care and intermediate care now. Richard has more of a, an acute care background, so he tends to concentrate on the acute stuff. But we do overlap hugely. We cover for each other and cover for Keith. So it's pretty much an all-round role, um, but with particular emphasis in, in certain areas. We also then have seven regional chief pharmacists, and these are posts that we fought very hard for um, and delighted to say they're all people are now in post in every one of the seven NHS England and NHS improvement regions. Uh, Michelle Cossey covers the Northeast New Yorkshire, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Michelle, will know her. She's um, been working in the area for, for quite a while now and uh, is doing a great job trying to sort of coordinate between the the national priorities and actually making things happen on the ground and of course we have other um, regional chief pharmacists um, across the country and they work very well and and uh, together and are uh, have regular meetings are in regular contact and lead on different things on behalf of the national team and then alongside those we also have uh, five regional pharmacy deans that are employed by Health Education England um, and Jane Brown in the northwest covers the the whole of the north. The regions are slightly different for Health Education England compared to NHS England and improvement um, but essentially Jane Brown works with Michelle um, uh, but concentrates on the the educational aspects and uh, the work of Health Education England uh, in in across the whole of the north of England. So if you don't know Jane already, I'm sure many of you do, um, then I would encourage you to get to know her. Uh, she's a very useful person in terms of uh, the whole sort of education and training agenda. We then have a, a number of different people that uh, work with us uh, in the national team. We have Andrew Davis, who's um, director of hospital pharmacy, who has done a lot of the work on the Carter report and um, a lot of the uh, productivity and efficiency work, particularly in secondary care. And Joshua, many of you will be familiar with, who runs the pharmacy integration program um, and heads up all the, all the pilots, some of which I'll mention in just a moment. Um, a really key person in making things happen and in certainly in promoting the, um, the sort of new clinical future for community pharmacy. And Slee works for NHS X um, and is our sort of go-to person for all things digital. And we have Bill Ryle, who's the National Controlled Drugs Accountable Officer. Um, so he uh, not only covers the east of England uh, part of his week as their regional chief pharmacist, but is also the national um, CDAO. Denise Farmer looks after health and justice um, and uh, keeps us on our toes and makes sure we don't forget all of our uh, patients that are in various detention centres across the country of various different types. Malcolm Crowley, specialised commissioning, who many of you will know and uh, looks at the, the the high cost drugs that fall under the um, specialised commissioning portfolio. And then newly imposed, many of you will know Tony Jameson, um, who uh, was at uh, the HSN in Yorkshire um, and is now recently been appointed as the Clinical Improvement Lead for Medicine Safety, um, a post that's sort of close to my own heart. I, I did a similar job um, at the old NPSA and uh, Tony, you know, I've known for a long time and I'm sure he's going to do a fantastic job there. And then last but not least, uh, Trevor Bezik, who um, used to be one of our regional pharmacy deans, um, recently retired, but now back working with us on uh, uh, for part of the week, looking at the pharmacy and education training issues across the whole piece. So, <clears throat> sorry, I've taken a few minutes there, but I think it's, it's just helpful to know who some of these people are and what their portfolios cover. So if I could have the next slide, please. So this is a, a slide that we use sometimes to try and put into context the different sort of levels of, um, of, of work that are going on, but to, importantly to um, demonstrate how we need to all work together to make things happen. 
So if you look at the bottom left hand quadrant of that slide, the National Pharmacy Leadership Team, um, I've just gone through, um, we sort of tend to lead on national policy and strategy and um, develop uh, development of practical support to, to whole systems and supporting regions. So we try and take uh, policy that is being developed at uh, NHS England and NHS Improvement and also of course the Department of Health and Social Care and other organisations and try to think through what that means for pharmacy practice, for the way we use medicines, um, and try to do that thinking in, at, at national level about how we turn that into a workable strategy. Then top left, we have the regional leadership teams, and I've mentioned some of the names there, and I think they're really key. I mean, I think they, they have a really tough job because they have to take the thinking that's going on at national level and actually turn it into something real, which is, is often um, quite a tricky balancing act to do. They have pressures, obviously, from within the regions themselves, um, but they're there to hold systems to account, support system development and improvement, and to form that link between uh, national teams and what's happening in uh, uh, in localities. I think one of the, the, the right hand side of this diagram are the really exciting places. So the ICS pharmacy system leadership group and I, I think the concept of an ICS, an integrated care system that brings together primary and secondary care um, and other areas as well such as mental health, such as community services, um, uh, bring them together into one sort of single system and decision making body um, I think is a really exciting prospect you know and the size of, of these organizations are going to be small enough to be able to be nimble and to to make a difference and yet big enough to encompass and bring together what I think certainly throughout my career has often felt like competing interests um, between the hospitals between what happens in primary care um, who's paying for what, who's doing what, how can we join pathways together. All of that thinking can be done at an ICS level and I think is a very exciting prospect. And then bottom right, we have the, the place-based and PCM-based multidisciplinary teams. And I think, again, this is a really exciting prospect. You know, it does feel different. You know, we've sort of been here before in some respects with CCGs and with PCTs. But PCNs do feel different. They do feel as if there's a genuine will to embrace multidisciplinary uh, working um, for all aspects of pharmacy and medicines to be really uh, integrated into those PCN teams. Um, and again, working um, at, a, at a level of sort of 50 to 60,000 patients, really able to be nimble, to be able to do things that benefit their, their local populations in a very joined up way that allows um, pharmacy to really start playing its, its full part. So I think um, particularly the right hand side of that diagram is a very exciting prospect. Can we have the next slide please? So one of the key things that um, we're working through, and this will be as no surprise to you, are structured medication reviews. And I think it's important just to spend a moment thinking about quite what these are because I think there's a lot of misconception out there um, that uh, pharmacists have been doing medication reviews for a long time and of course they have done um, but I think what we're talking about here is something quite in depth something that requires a great degree of clinical knowledge and clinical skill in terms of looking at the patient holistically um, of feeding into uh, wider pathways and taking on some of the more complex problems that we see patients have with their medicines. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the service specification within the uh, the primary care network uh, contracts requires that they identify and prioritise PCN patients who would benefit from a structured medication review. And there are some um, patient cohorts, patient groups there that um, that need to be included in that thinking. So we're not actually saying um, uh, how PCN should do this, but those uh, patients that are listed there um, need to be included in that um, in that prioritisation and in that identification process. And of course, we're talking about the most vulnerable members in our society who would really benefit from a structured medication review. Quite often, these patients are on multiple medicines, um, as some of which we have no idea why they're on them, uh, some of which should have been stopped a long time ago, 
some of which are causing problems that the patients choose not to take, um, and, and so on and so on. So thinking particularly about patients in care homes, patients with complex and problematic polypharmacy um, needs, those on medicines that we know are associated particularly with medication error. And we know from things like the WHO report, medication without harm, um, where those risky areas are, you know, thinking about things like antiplatelets, for instance, anticoagulants, we've known for a long time they are prone to error um, because of the nature of the medicines that we're dealing with. Patients with severe frailty, um, particularly those that are isolated and housebound, recent hospital admissions, um, and also something I'll come on to mention in a little while, um, those using potentially addictive pain uh, medicines um, and thinking about the report that's recently be pu been published um, by Public Health England along, along around drugs that cause dependency. So the PCNs are being um, asked to deliver a volume of structured medication reviews, but recognising that these to be done by pharmacists working within general practice and that the number of those are limited at the moment. There's a, as you will be aware, a big recruitment drive to try and get more into post. Um, but until people are up to sort of full capacity in terms of the pharmacists and critically the pharmacy technicians that are that are working within primary care and within particularly within general practice, um, uh, uh, then we need to um, recognise that the volume of SMRs that could be done is going to de be dependent on that recruitment process. We need to make sure patients know what to expect from an SMR um, and that they are uh, undertaken by appropriately trained clinicians who are working within their sphere of competence and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, IT is going to play a big role in this um, and the activity um, that we are expecting um, some of the this work to pick up on is stuff that the CCGs have been working on for some time. Things like um, the antimicrobial resistance agenda, for instance, medicines that cause dependency, as I've mentioned before. Um, there's a whole lot of work around uh, meter dose inhalers um, and the the policy work around uh, medicines are, that have been identified as being of low priority. So, um, and I think the really key thing here at those bottom points that that structured medication reviews shouldn't be seen as a standalone. They need to be linked in with work that's happening in community pharmacies, work that's happening in hospital pharmacies, um, so that uh, uh, we can refer patients in and out of other services, such as the new medicine service. Um, we can refer people in and out of things like the new discharge medication service that's coming online, which I'll talk about in a moment, so that we have a much more joined up approach to the way we, we treat people's medicines. Next slide, please. So, of course, when we do these kind of things, we we are always under pressure to measure, to uh, to make sure that what we're doing is working. And these are just some of the um, the measures that are currently being used to track and monitor the effect that different initiatives are having. So thinking about the prevention um, and inequalities agendas, um, we have um, things like the percentage of patients aged over 65 who've received a flu vaccine, for instance. Um, around the medicine safety, a lot of uh, a lot of this is determined by what we can measure, um, but certainly things like uh, patients on particular medications that can cause gastric bleeds, for instance, making sure that they are given the right gastro protection, um, and that we're trying to reduce the chances of them having an adverse event to uh, as, to their medicines as much as we possibly can do. I think an interesting one there is a personalised care one, because this is a relatively new agenda, um, particularly when we start thinking about social prescribing and link workers um, that are coming on stream soon. Um, how do we really address this personalised care agenda and really think about what patients want from taking their medicines? And in fact, do they need to take their medicines at all or are, are there other approaches that are much more appropriate? And we're starting to see people coming into post now that can do that wider thinking and link people up with other things that are happening locally that, uh, that may mean the burden of the medications is reduced. Next slide, please. We have the next slide, please. Thank you. 
So I did want to just touch on um, the role of community pharmacy in primary care networks. And um, I think the first thing to say is, you know, despite what you might read sometimes, we are acutely aware of the pressure that community pharmacy is under, um, of the way they stood up to the plate uh, during the first wave of COVID and are starting to do the same again now in the second wave. Um, and our thanks go to all of our colleagues working um, in community pharmacy and of course every other sector um, that uh, that are doing that work at the moment and you know we we understand that uh, the prospect of the next six months a winter with flu and covid um, you know is going to pose some significant challenges and uh, i know <clears throat> i know community pharmacy is is going to be there for people which is great but the pharmacy quality scheme um, guidance that's been in place for a number of years now but the concentration on that has been around trying to make pharmacy, community pharmacies an integral part of those primary care networks. And I think that's really important, you know, when we think about the medium to longer term, that we cement community pharmacies role within those PCNs. And it's really important that those pharmacy teams are involved in the work of the PCNs um, and that they, they are proactive in getting involved wherever they can um, so that they become an integral and uh, indispensable part of delivering that PCN agenda. Uh, the business continuity and flu domains in the primary in, in the um, in the uh, pharmacy quality scheme um, really encourage teams to work collaboratively with other primary care providers across the PCN and we need to see a lot more of that. We've also got the uh, the network contract DES, the PCN DES, um, which I've mentioned already. But I think, again, I just want to emphasise that it's really important that we join all this up. So the structured medication reviews that I've just mentioned um, need to link into the new medicine service, um, the uh, community pharmacy consultation service and the discharge medication service that we're seeing coming online at the start of January where community pharmacies will be told about the medicines that patients are discharged from hospital on um, make an assessment as to what kind of intervention if any those patients need and uh, either play their part in that intervention themselves or refer them refer the patients on to colleagues for perhaps a more in-depth intervention such as a structured medication review so it's that joined upness um, of uh, that, that I think the the quality scheme and the PCN DES. If we really approach this in the right way, we can start to see a very much more joined up service. That is is you know hopefully in a few years we will see people people will say well how can we possibly do without this now? Next slide, please. Education is really important, and I've mentioned this uh, once already, but I think um, I think it's worth just spending a few minutes on this because let's not forget the roles that we are asking our pharmacists and our pharmacy technicians to undertake now are very, very different from the roles that we were asking them to undertake um, only a few years ago. And in some respects, our education and training um, does not equip us to do what is now being asked of us in a, in a, in a safe and competent way. We all have a, um, a, a, an excellent sort of grounding in science uh, and grounding in the use of medicines. But what we what our education and training programmes have never done um, is give us that clinical experience and insight in the early years that we're now asking people to really embrace. So for instance, we don't teach people routinely in our schools of pharmacy how to clinically examine a patient. And that's becoming more and more important as new uh, clinical services come online um, and as, as the roles change and as, as people's, uh, the skill mix changes and for use of a phrase I don't particularly like, but for want of a better one, working to the top of their license. Um, so we need to make sure that people are up to speed, that they, they are not being asked to do things they're not equipped to do. Um, and I think the most dangerous thing is, is people not knowing what they don't know. Um, I think, you know, people don't enter into, um, into things maliciously on the whole, um, but it's very easy to think you can do something without realising what it is you, you're not aware of. So we need to make sure that PCNs um, 
uh, ensure that only appropriately trained clinicians are working within their sphere of competence. And of course, that is a professional requirement anyway, um, undertake structured medication reviews. These are very different from um, uh, accuracy checks, from making sure, uh, from medicines use reviews, for instance. It's a very different issue uh, trying to help patients understand how to take their medicine in a way that's going to give them the most benefit than it is actually reviewing that patient's medication and making changes, starting, stopping medicines, making changes to doses, um, reviewing blood results, adjusting medication in light of those results, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very different thing. And I think there is a danger that people look at medication review as a single thing, and, and I think it's far from it. So we've said that um, certainly for pharmacists that have uh, are employed under the NHS England and Improvement um, ARRS scheme, they must have um, completed the CPP pathway or at least be enrolled on it. And that, that of course, leads to independent prescribing as well. Um, they People will undergo an assessment of prior learning and experience. And if people have that experience and those skills already, then they are exempt from huge chunks of the course or often. Um, we don't want people repeating what they've already done, but I think it's important that they sit down with somebody independent who, and have a conversation about quite where they are and what their learning needs might be. Um, we, in the long term, I think there, there will be a, a credentialing programme where everybody can uh, be credentialed against prior learning, prior experience, um, and we won't need this piecemeal approach. But we're not quite at that point yet, and that's going to be dependent on education training reform going through over the next few years. Um, we are developing um, a new educational framework. That will, uh, that will eventually work its way through and equip people to do what's being asked of them. Um, and as I say, that will include training in independent prescribing. But it's really important that we don't leave the current workforce behind. It's all very well training our new pharmacists in new ways to do new and exciting things. But we have a huge legacy workforce out there. Um, and we need to make sure that we don't leave them behind and that we give them the appropriate skills as well so that we don't end up with a two-tier system. Um, and that's something we really don't want to see. So I think a lot of effort is going to go into making sure that not only our new pharmacists are trained differently, but that our current pharmacists and our current pharmacy technicians are trained in a way that actually equips them to do what we're now asking them to do. Um, we've had questions about pharmacy technicians undertaking SMRs. I'm going to be quite honest with you. We don't see that happening at the moment. Um, who knows what the future holds, um, but they certainly have a key role to play um, in PCNs, in community pharmacy. And I think as skill mix changes and as the roles uh, evolve, then the role of the pharmacy technician is going to become increasingly important. And shared decision making, um, that again, something we've never really been trained to do, but is very, very um, important and to the fore at the moment. So um, actually understanding how to make decisions with patients so that they feel empowered to challenge, um, they feel empowered to ask questions and they feel a part of that process. Uh, we now know is going to achieve much greater results than if we try and do things to them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Whereas I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit over, but I, I will finish soon. Um, so the NHS People Plan, perhaps something to touch on, um, and pharmacy. Uh, pharmacy does feature in the NHS People Plan, and there is a uh, delivery commitment for um, community-based specialist mental health pharmacists across the country, and I think that's quite an exciting prospect. Maybe not as many as we would have liked, but um, it's a really good start, and I think they're going to become really important. And one of the things that I really want to see happen is much more collaborative working between pharmacists in different sectors. You know, I want community pharmacists who are faced with a patient that might be a bit tricky with something they're not overly familiar with to be able to 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 know which specialist pharmacist in the acute trust to ring to get advice on that particular patient, which, um, you know, how to, to to have regular discussions with pharmacists working in general practice about individual patients and how they can best meet their needs. You know, and I want to see much more collaborative working across the sectors. We're now seeing pharmacists and technicians working on flexible contracts, working in the multiple in, in multiple sectors themselves. But even where that's not happening, we should be talking to each other far more 
um, than we have done in the past and working as a genuine team rather than in individual silos. So that education and training reform is going to be really key. Um, we are uh, working with the GPHC and with other uh, organisations to um, uh, introduce clinical placements in year one to four of the of the M-Farm and the pre-reg year turning into a genuine foundation programme, all of which will have a much more, uh, uh, will have a much greater clinical focus um, with clinical placements that are interspersed throughout that, that five year period. And then of course, moving on to advanced practice and eventually to consultant practice so that we have a genuine career pathway for all pharmacists, no matter what sector you're working in, that everybody understands um, that people can work through throughout their careers. So I think very exciting times ahead in terms of education and training. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't dwell on this one too much, but um, this is this is just sort of a slide that talks about why we need to make those changes. And, and essentially it's saying, you know, the demands and the challenges that we're facing now um, are very different to, they, to what they were um, a few years ago. Um, in some respects, you know, the hospital sector and the, the um, primary care sector um, have too often been seen as competing. Um, and I think we, we need to get to a stage where we have a much more flexible workforce that is comfortable with working between sectors, working on rota in rotational posts, working across different sectors without thinking, I'm a community pharmacist, that, that, that's me for the rest of my career now. Not that there's anything wrong with that, if that's what you want, um, but we need to make it easier for people to, to move around the system um, and, uh, and really be able to contribute as best they can. Next slide, please. OK, so I will finish. So, yeah, that's the final slide there. And I, again, I won't dwell on this because I know we've got speakers later on in the day that are going to be concentrating on these. But just to mention that these two reports are really uh, important and are um, are seen as very important at a national level. So the over prescribing review um, that was commissioned by the Secretary of State, Keith Ridge was asked by the Secretary of State to undertake this review um, and uh, it brought together delegates from across a whole range of professions um, and patients and charities and uh, patient groups to look at the problem of over prescribing in England and how that can be tackled. That report is, is going through its final stages of editing at the moment and, and hopefully should be out very soon and I think that's going to have a big effect on the work that we're being asked to do. And then alongside of that of course we have the PhD review of prescribed medicines that may cause dependence and uh, looking at um, a specific range of medicines um, and making recommendations that cover five areas that you can see there. And I think together those two reports that we'll hear more about later in the agenda, um, I think are going to be really important in terms of the focus um, and the role that we're going to be asked to play. And I think um, you know, pharmacy should be right at the heart of this. Pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, pharmacy teams need to be right in amongst this um, because if we haven't got something to offer in these agendas, then um, there's something something seriously wrong. And I think, you know, pharmacy will be looked to 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 really lead on these areas and to really make a difference. And, and I think if we can make a difference in these areas, we can make a dramatic difference to to people's lives. And that's what we're here for. So I'll stop there, Waz. Thank you. My apologies. I've gone a little bit over time there, but hopefully that sort of set the scene for people and uh, uh, I shall hang around for a while and uh, enjoy listening to some of the rest of the presentations. OK, I just want to quickly thank Bruce. That's brilliant. Thanks very much for giving us an update. And it's been it's really helpful to understand everything that's going on and there's lots going on. We are running a little bit ahead, ahead schedule, but I'm sure we'll catch up. Um, so next up, I'm going to invite Jim Donovan, um, who's Medicines Optimization Academic Practitioner at Sunderland CCG, as well as the University of Sunderland School of Pharmacy. And Gemma's going to be prescribing in primary care. care. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gemma Donovan. I'm a pharmacist academic practitioner at Sunderland CCG. And I'm also a senior lecturer in pharmacy practice at the University of Sunderland. And the project I'm presenting was led by Sunderland CCG and explored how we get started with deprescribing within the primary care setting. 
So it's probably helpful to think about our starting point before we started the project. We know that we've got a problem with polypharmacy. We're ranked 13 highest in the country for the number of medicines prescribed per patient. And this was very much on our agenda when the call for projects from the AHSN came about. And within the medicines optimization team at the CCG, we obviously have regular contact with our prescribers. And the anecdotal feedback that we were getting was that they didn't really know where to start with deprescribing. We'd already made available or highlighted awareness of the stop frail tool on our, as part of our guidelines, but this didn't seem to be being used in routine practice. And so one of the aims of the project was to think about how we can support prescribers, basically just start to think about deprescribing as part of their routine practice. And our initial hunch was, well, maybe if we choose a small number of messages around deprescribing and we really focus on implementing them, maybe that will build some confidence and then we can get people to then use those skills and transfer them to other clinical areas and other deprescribing messages. And so that was our original intention was to identify a small number of messages and then to co-design a set of tools with primary care clinicians, which could support um, the kind of the, the use of these deprescribing messages within routine practice. Now we did actually go about and do those things, but actually the end result isn't exactly where we thought we might end up being. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to lead you through the story of how the project kind of evolved and how we got to where we did. Um, but if you want the details of the methods and the specifics of the results, you'll find all those in the AHSN um, project report, which is available on the website. So I would direct you to that and I'm also happy to answer questions either in the chat or via email after the session. Now, one of the key things that we did as part of this project was take what I've called an exploratory approach. So we had no preset ideas about which deprescribing message pieces we thought might be prioritized because we were going to do that as part of the project. And we also didn't have any expectations about what we thought this co-design process might end up with in terms of tools to support clinicians to implement these deprescribing messages. But we did use recognised methods in order to structure how we ended up getting the data that we did and how we ended up with the products that we ended up with at the end. So this project basically consisted of four different phases. The first phase was to identify potential deprescribing messages that could have been selected for prioritisation for this implementation. And we started with tools that were already available, either in the peer reviewed literature or have been published by recognized organizations. And we basically deconstructed these for all of the different individual messages that they each contained. We then had three workshops, and the first one involved hospital specialists who we got in a room. We provided them with deprescribing messages relating to their own discipline and started off with them prioritizing which of those they felt were most important for their clinical area. And then we brought them all together and we built a consensus about which of the ones might be the most appropriate for across the healthcare setting. And we did each of these using what we call uh, the nominal group technique. For the second and third workshop, we used a variety of tools which have been included in a human centered design toolkit, which has been produced by IDEO.org. And this basically provides a way of creating what they call um, designs based on a design challenge and they encourages you to use um, your end users as part of that co-design process. So in this case, we were trying to design tools for clinicians from primary care. And so they were the end users who we incorporated and invited into these workshops. However, in the third workshop, we did also include two patients who basically acted as a feedback panel whereby uh, as ideas were generated, they could go and present them to the patients and the patients could give their feedback on what they thought um, about the designs that were being generated. Now we use a variety of tools from the Human Centered Design Toolkit, but I think for me, the one that was the most powerful and the most insightful is what they call how might we statements. And the generation of these comes from starting with what they call insight statements. So as part of trying to um, delve into what your design problem is, 
They get you to generate statements about your understanding, about what the problem is that needs to be overcome. So for example, for our project, that patients don't expect a conversation about stopping medicines if they don't perceive that there are any problems with their medication. And yet you then take these insight statements and reframe them into these how might we statements. And this helps you identify potential opportunities for what you could potentially do or what you could potentially design in order to meet those barriers or potential challenges. So in this case, how might we prepare patients to have a conversation about stopping medicines, even if they don't perceive any problems? And then this creates what they call design. So we came up with three design challenges that we set the groups to do in the third workshop. The first one was how might we um, incorporate deprescribing recommendations into our locally produced clinical guidelines? How do we communicate that actually there might be benefits to deprescribing to patients and communicate why there might be benefits to deprescribing? And thirdly, can we come up with a phrase to um, replace you'll be on this for the rest of your life? So then when we're communicating the potential duration of, of medications, that we're not saying that you'll be on this indefinitely, that we open it up that potentially in the future, this could be stopped once it comes to a point where it is no longer appropriate uh, for you. And across each of the three designs, there was a common theme around asking whether medications were working. And so the guidelines should aim to highlight to clinicians how do you evaluate if medicines are working? What are the things to look out for? And how do you incorporate that into your medication reviews? That adopting a phrase such as, we'll only prescribe these as long as they're working for you, when you're trying to describe to a patient how long they can anticipate being on a medicine for, just gives you a bit of wiggle room so that in the future, if they are no longer working, then having that conversation about them being stopped is a little bit easier because you're kind of preparing the patients for that right at the start of the treatment process. And also getting patients to reflect on whether they think medicines are working for them as well, in preparation in particular for medication reviews. And we make use of this word working and it meaning different things to different people. So trying to think about the question, not just about whether medicines seem to be effective, but also whether they have side effects, whether there might be problems with medication adherence, and also actually whether patients might not notice that the medicines are working because they're actually things like primary prevention. So once we'd finished the third workshop as part of the official project, Sunderland CCG went on to commission a company called MAPI to develop a range of materials which would support the implementation of this idea that we want to be asking patients and clinicians to ask the question whether medicines seem to be working or not. And from this, we've created uh, several tools. The core of the toolkit is two checklists, one that is directed at patients and one that is directed at healthcare professionals. And it just asks three questions that each party should ask in preparation for a medication review. We've also developed two versions of a symptom tracker to again help um, both clinicians and patients identify whether, for example, symptoms are being managed as a result of receiving treatment and thinking about either deprescribing medicines that don't seem to be supporting um, symptom management or following a trial of deprescribing, tracking the impact of that over time. And then finally, we have these creative materials that can act as a visual cue within our guidelines to highlight where the deprescribing recommendations are. So the next step are to take these materials that we've created and we're trialing them with um, structured medication reviews with our PCN pharmacists within Sunderland. We're also planning to evaluate the perceived impact of the materials in Sunderland in terms of how they might help or not uh, structured medication reviews and also the deprescribing process. And we're also making all of the materials available via the AHSN Northeast North Cumbria website for anybody who wants to use them. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to the AHSN for funding the project, which allowed us to spend some quality time with our clinicians, exploring uh, the potential barriers and facilitators to deprescribing, and of course, everybody who then subsequently attended in order for us to be able to come up with the materials that we have for this project. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Gemma. That's a fantastic, fantastic piece of work and a really novel approach to, um, to looking at deprescribing. Um, you know, good luck with, with the project. We hopefully, hopefully we can.
get you back at some point to tell us how it's all going. Um, so we'll, we'll move on. We're going, we're going to coll collate the questions in the chat um, afterwards. And by all means, speakers, if, if people are asking you questions, respond to them um, through, throughout the, uh, the session. So next up, delighted to have Rachel Berry from NHS County, uh, County Durham CCG, who is going to talk about polypharmacy education. Hi, Rachel. Hi, can everybody hear me OK? Um, so I'm going to talk about the project that we run within County Durham um, CCG and across County Durham as a whole. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this project was a joint project with the LPC within County Durham um, and our local trust at um, CDDFT. Um, and, and we worked on it collab collaboratively with the AHSM funding. So we all know that inappropriate polypharmacy is a big issue and it causes deaths and uh, hospital admissions. Uh, we know that 50% of them are preventable and that there's lots of guidance around ways that could be used to solve this. But as Gemma said, and as we found within our um, CCG, not a lot of our clinicians out there know where to start so the aim for our project was to look at developing a series of education sessions that could help our local prescribers and practice based pharmacists with this key question. Um, we also wanted to hold an engagement session with our local community pharmacists, as we were well aware that we needed their support with um, helping um, communicate some of this with our patients. And we wanted to share what we were doing within primary care. Next slide, please. So if I said a hospital pharmacist, a community pharmacist and a GP practice pharmacist walked into a room, you'd probably all be quite concerned about what the punchline was going to be. Um, but this was very much the basis of our working group that we set up to develop the education sessions. So we got pharmacists from our local trust, the local pharmaceutical committee and GP practices within the CCG to work together because um, we knew that these were the people that we were really targeting the sessions to. Um, we wanted to come up with them to come up with ideas of what topics they wanted to cover, but also sort of key guidance, what they thought should be included to make it really practical and useful for the people who were going to be attending the sessions. So this included the clinical areas, um, key messages, um, that sort of thing around deep prescribing. Next slide, please. So as you can see, the, these are quite large A1 sheets of paper. And what we came out with were um, very useful but very long um, outcomes from these wor this working group. However, what we did decide on was four clinical areas that um, our pharmacists thought were really important and were areas that they felt less confident at deep prescribing or were key clinical priorities. So we came up with deep prescribing in pain, deep prescribing in cardiovascular disease, deep prescribing in patients at risk of falls, and deep prescribing in patients at risk of acute kidney injury. And what the working group were really clear on was that these needed to be case based um, and looking at implementation of the seven steps approach that's highlighted in the Scottish polypharmacy guidance to make sure that it was really specific to each individual patient. We also needed to include practical advice about processes and communication at a local level to help with deep prescribing, um, but also have uh, links to key national guidance in there too. So with this in mind, we split up the sessions and had um, the development of each session was led by one hospital pharmacist and one GP practice based pharmacist um, who worked together on each subject. And then it came back to the working group for sort of overall approval so that we had everybody's input on it. Um, next slide, please. So once we had the series of four educational slide sets um, that were really based around practical cases um, and real life cases, our next challenge was delivering them. Um, in order to ensure maximum opportunity, what we wanted to do was deliver them online. Now, bearing in mind this was, um, we did all of these last summer. This was before the big increase in webinars and that we've seen since COVID. Um, and we were really concerned about running these. None of the working group had ever delivered sessions in this way before. And actually, it was really scary. But in hindsight, um, it worked really well and it gave us all a lot of experience that has in, uh, since then been absolutely vital. 
in order to make it slightly easier for ourselves, we did deliver the session in groups. So we were real, all in the same room, which which allowed for a really conversational style um, and gave us a balanced view. So we had a GP practice pharmacist and a hospital pharmacist and myself in all the sessions. So we did have some minor setbacks that all of you will be really familiar with now around Wi-Fi and difficulties and recording with on PowerPoint and questions and answers, people nobody putting questions in. Um, but in general, it was um, they worked really well and we had at least 35 attendees on each of the live streams and having made them available um, on our intranet, they have since been um, viewed over 125 times each, um, which means that we really did get out there and I was, I was really pleased with those numbers. Um, we also shared them with the LPC um, so that they could make them available to their members as well. Next slide, please. So as part of the project, we also held a community pharmacy engagement session, um, which was aimed at community pharmacists within the locality to make sure that they were aware of what we were doing about de-prescribing and to give them some of the clinical information that had been deemed to be relevant by our working group. So we covered some of these key points of the webinar series and discussed how they might be able to support that work, particularly with patients. Now, to be honest, this wasn't particularly successful. Um, it unfortunately got delayed because of the um, workload within community pharmacy last at the end of last year with audits and things. Um, it got delayed till March and that was just as COVID hit. So we had we didn't have great attendance. However, the, the people who did attend did find it really useful and we did have really positive feedback from them. Um, we also I think it also highlights the issue nationally around the deep prescribing agenda within community pharmacies um, and the need for sort of a, a national push to, to um, encourage that engagement from that sector. Next slide, please. Um, however, sort of overall, the feedback that we had on on all of the sessions um, was overwhelmingly positive, and the intent the attendees really valued the practical case based information that was included within the education sessions, um, and also the multi sector input. Um, and this really feeds into what Bruce was saying about making sure that we really are collabor collaborating across the sectors. Um, Many of the attendees said they felt much more confident to start de-prescribing conversations um, with their patients since attending um, and have also shared examples of specific patients where they have utilised the knowledge that they gained um, and the confidence that they didn't have before. Next slide, please. So once we'd put all of this um, stuff together, we realised that we had a fantastic resource of these educational presentations, slide sets that would be easily um, uh, usable by other people within different areas. Um, so what we did is um, make them much more generic and make it clear where local or um, CCG level data could be inputted to make them more relevant in in a different in a different area, so that people could just pick them up and present them in other places. So. Um, these have been shared with the AHSN and we also won a press grip award um, for for the same slide set. So um, they have been shared nationally. Um, we're absolutely wanting people to use these and I hope that um, my CCG colleagues might be able to pick them up and use them um, within their areas and also within practices. If, um, that they're there and ready to use. If you have local data you can slot in, you'd be able to, to put some of this education out to other people. Please let me know if you do use them as well. I think um, that would be really interesting to see if people are using them in other places. Now, obviously we're planning on um, rolling out some of this education for other members of staff, um, nurses, um, the wider healthcare team. Um, and, and if people are using them in an innovative way, that that, that would be really useful. Um, if you just click again, please. Um, so they do all have the caveats <laughs> that you need to delete the slide before presenting. And, and there's um, local adjustments are clearly highlighted in, in sort of red that you can put into the slides. So hopefully there'd be a useful resource. Um, so all that remains is to just uh, thank my colleagues from all the sectors who helped with the project and the AHSN uh, for funding it and allowing me this opportunity to share the work with you. Uh, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Richard. Really interesting project and, and a great legacy it leaves behind too. Um, I, you may have said this, where, where can you get these from? Are they available online or, or do we have to contact you? So the slide sets themselves will be available on the AHSM website that's sharing all of these resources. Okay. And they're also available on Pressquip. But if anyone um, 
certainly within County Durham, they're all available on our intranet. Um, but if anyone wants the actual recordings that we did, they are quite localised, but I can share them if, if people are interested. Fantastic. Well done. Really good, really good piece of work. All right, so uh, moving on, and um, we've caught back up with time as well, so that's excellent. Uh, great to have Alistair Patterson with us to, to give us an update on his um, reductions in hypnotics prescribing work. Now, many of you will have seen Alistair's work uh, at the Great North Pharmacy Research Collaborative event. Um, uh, God, was it last year? It seems like a lifetime ago. Anyway, and, and very impressive piece of work around helping patients can, can come off or reduce the, the hypnotic prescribing, uh, hypnotic drugs. So over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Wes. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, as Wes said, I'm looking at um, supporting reductions in hypnotic prescribing. Um, and at the time of the project, I was working at Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Way, or CNTW Foundation Trust. But I'm now uh, living back in the Northwest. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please? So, oh yeah, sorry, one more slide. So uh, originally I kind of came across this idea um, I met a patient who uh, was a chef, a reasonably a middle-aged gentleman um, on one of our wards. He had schizophrenia, insomnia and depression. Um, and he told me about how he worked really long hours. And after he came back from work, uh, he'd go to the gym, then come home, drink alcohol to help with the sleep. Um, but it didn't really work. Um, and he was really struggling with sleep, despite being on Zopclone, Hydroxyzine and Promethazine which is obviously quite a, quite a pill burden there um, in terms of sedating medication. And I, I said to him, well, when was the last time that the, the, the sleep medications you're taking helped? When, do you, when was the last time the Zopoclone helped? And he said, well, about 22, I've been taking it for about 22 years, but the last time I felt like it worked is about six months after I started taking it. So there's a person there who's been on Zopoclone for 21 and a half years with absolutely no benefit, um, and, and he's been taking it daily. Uh, each, each night time. So that really hit home to me that there's something we're not quite focusing on sleep well enough in healthcare, particularly in psychiatric care, um, and we're not focusing on sleep medication and reviewing it properly. Next slide, please. So yeah, this prompted me to think, do we have the right approach for treating insomnia? So why is it needed? Well, one in three patients are prescribed benzodiazepines at discharge um, from, from hospitals, and one in five of those um, con receiving continuous long-term benzodiazepines um, are still receiving them 12 months post-discharge. So there's an issue there, not just around benzodiazepines, but around um, Z drugs as well and other medications people use to, to help with sleep. Just the other day I was speaking to a patient who said the GP had said to take cetirizine for sleep at night time. So there's a lot of misinformation I think around sleep and a lot of bad prescribing habits. Next slide please. So why is this happening? Well in psychiatric care I found that I'd speak to the psychiatrist and they'd say, well, the patient came in on the Zofclin, so I don't really want to stop it because the crisis team or the GP might have prescribed it. Um, even though they're sleeping better, I don't want to stop it in case they start sleeping worse again. Um, and then I'll go to speak to the GP um, or, or GPs I spoke to in, in practice had said, well, the psychiatrist often starts the sleep medication, so I don't want to touch it. So there's this passing of the book going round and round in a circle where nobody was wanting to take responsibility for for sleep medication, whether that was due to lack of experience or lack of understanding of why the patient was on it, um, it was difficult to tell. Next slide, please. But really, we're all involved in this. Um, pharmacists, nurses alike, even the patient um, has a, a big part to play in making sure they're not kept on unnecessary medications for prolonged periods of time. And I found really lots of people were not following evidence based practice. And the reasons for that are, are multi, multiple. So workload time and time pressures, a lack of resources, a lack of authority to change practice. Some people would say, well, I know this isn't right, but the consultant said this or, you know, th these are the structures in place. Um, the workplace is resistant to the change um, or some workplaces have that dangerous, dangerous phrase of that's the way we've always done it. So um, people being uh, discharged on Zopoclone and, and benzodiazepines. Well, that's where we've always done it. Uh, we've never, we've never taken them off on the discharge script. Well, that's a bit of a worrying phrase to live by. So there is that resistance to evidence-based practice in the workplace too, at times. Next slide, please. So what can we do about it? This project set about to change that. So we use something called the Knowledge to Action Framework, which is a framework that basically helps you to close what's called the evidence practice gap. So the evidence says this, the practice is that. How do we bring the two together? How do we bring evidence into the practice? 
um, and make sure we're getting best outcomes because of it. So there's quite a nice framework there. It's um, a little bit sort of uh, explanatory going through the different stages there of, of how you can how you can develop interventions to address an evidence practice gap. Um, and so the interventions we came up with through a co-design process um, were a video, a poster and a handbook. So the video is nine minutes long and just tries to give an overview of the subject area. The poster was initially designed to act as a reminder for nursing staff um, of the alternatives they could they could do before administering hypnotics. But now it's become more of a checklist that they can go through before um, hypnotics is given out just to make sure that they've done everything. And there's a patient centred version of that as well. So patients themselves um, can can go through and, and address those things. And there's a handbook as well, which is um, it was written off the back of um, a paper that um, I mean, Adam Rathbone and uh, Rebecca Richards from wrote, um, uh, but the, the, the content of that paper was about um, reviewing in, insomnia patients, um, looking at the, is it, it's in the, the articles are in the PJ and the handbook's just a bit more of a, a bulked out version of those two papers there. Um, just looking at how we can treat insomnia properly in terms of diagnosis and management, because a lot of the times with sleep disorders, poor sleep of itself is not a diagnosis it's just a symptom it's just like saying i've got a bad head i've got poor sleep but what is causing the poor sleep is it insomnia is it a circadian rhythm disorder you know is it is it bad sleep habits is it poor sleep hygiene really kind of drilling down to what is causing the sleep disorder is really really important because often we treat things with medications that do not need medications or zopoclonin for instance is the wrong thing for for, for treating certain sleep disorders so those interventions um, were created trying to bear in mind the generaliz generalizability of them. So trying to make sure that they're applicable not only in psychiatry, but in general practice, in, in general hospitals, all sorts of places. And they're all available online. The link's at the end of the presentation if you if you want to have a look. I'd recommend just even just having a look at the video will hopefully change your mind a little bit about sleep and its importance. Next slide, please. So yeah, sorry, those are the three resources there. Um, and you can see the, the posters, the checklist, the video, and uh, the handbook is a, a bit more of a, a document. If you're, if you're struggling with sleep, the handbook um, can sometimes be quite a useful therapeutic tool because it'll definitely send you to sleep um, the first few pages of it anyway. Next slide, please. So uh, I've got two slides on methods. One's looking at the intervention, how we designed that. So like we said before, it was a co-design approach. Um, and we, you know, we got lots of different people there, researchers, clinicians, um, psychiatrists, pharmacists, nursing staff, um, lots of lot and peer support workers as well who had had struggled with sleep in the past. Lots of people there to try and get as much feedback and uh, information as we could in terms of developing, choosing the right interventions and then how we actually develop them going forwards. And the video was was kind of trialled at the the AHSN conference, I think it was about a year ago, and then um, it has been subsequently developed since. So there's a more professional version now on YouTube. Then the implementation strategies, um, the interventions were delivered in parallel, so all at the same time. Um, and we looked across eight wards, um, which included one control ward at a geographically distant site to prevent migration of practice. So one of the things we were worried about was if um, the seven wards were along one site, if we made one of those wards a control ward, nurses might cover shifts between them and then might might bring good practice with them, um, which is obviously a good thing. But in terms of proving the efficacy of an intervention, it's not necessarily a great thing. We had a two month implementation period. So we looked at um, data before and after that two month period um, and measured the hypnotic prescribing rates and also the self confidence scores of staff um, in managing sleep disorders too, because we felt that was important to get across. Um, whether staff felt the interventions had helped and then whether we could evidence that whether the interventions had made a dent in prescribing administration rates. Um, and as I said before, it's not mapped to that knowledge to action framework. Next slide, please. So looking at the evaluation methods, um, we did a retrospective drug chart audit um, over two one month periods. So the pre uh, intervention month, we looked at a count of the administrations and the, num the times things were prescribed and then the number of times each thing that was prescribed was administered for a month. Then we had two months of implementation and then we did another month of post-intervention measurement similar to the first. Um, and so, yeah, so we did a count of the number of prescriptions on hip of hypnotics on the charts and then a count of the number of administrations of hypnotics against uh, those charts too. And we also did a, a Likert scale for staff self-confidence rating 
as well, looking at their approach to their confidence in terms of medication strategies and in psychological strategies for helping with sleep. Next slide, please. So the results, I'm quite pleased with the results, to be honest. There's a decrease in every ward except for um, so PICU, which is a psychiatric intensive care unit. So people there, generally speaking, uh, are suffering with greater, uh, with greater mental health difficulties than people on the other wards. And so really, in terms of uh, re reflecting on that, it's maybe it's not in the most appropriate place for um, an intervention about reducing hypnotics, because often those people are in dire need of hypnotics if they're severely manic and they, they just need sleep to get their brain back into um, a normal a normal process. Um, so use identified there and then also the control ward we saw an increase there too. And uh, the female acute ward uh, remained the same in terms of the the uh, the prescribing rates. Next slide please. And then looking at administration rates, a similar pattern can be seen. So you've got a decrease in most settings for some reason, the mixed rehab ward just they had a hypnosis prescribed, but didn't administer any over the, the period of time there. But I suppose those people are more ready to move back into community again, um, and so that they they may not need hypnotics particularly. Um, so that's, that's that's a good thing really. And then PICU again, psychiatric intensive care, there's an increase, and then the control ward there's an increase too. But generally speaking, across the board, there's a reduction there in the both the prescribing and the administration rate. So the administration rates show that. To me, shows that the nurses it's had an impact on nursing staff, and they've reduced the, the, the administration, even if there's no impact on prescribing rates. And then when prescribing rates fall, so things have been de-prescribed off the drug charts, so it's had an impact on doctors, and um, in terms of them taking things off the charts that aren't being used or stopping medication. Next slide, please. So looking at um, the staff self-confidence rating scores, you can see there there's a there is an increase in both the the confidence in terms of using medication to help patients sleep and using psychological strategies to help patients sleep. So um, medication we did a bit talk through in the video and then there's stuff in the handbook as well about that. And then psychological strategies, there's inflammation, obviously there's the sleep hygiene measures um, and they're in the the prescribers check, uh, sorry, the, the poster, which is kind of like a checklist for people to go through. Um, and then there's the the cognitive behavioural therapy aspects of it too. So it's a bit of a kind of worms looking into cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia because psychologists will say, well, you, you have to be properly trained to do it. Um, and they're absolutely right to do the kind of far end of, of, of CBT. You do need significant training um, and, and, and sort of they do diplomas and things in that. But for the sake of, of most clinicians, I think it's really important to have an appreciation of what CBTI is um, because a lot of it is sleep hygiene measures and then a few other bits um, and if we all had an awareness of it I'm sure there'd be far less hypnotic prescribing um, across the country. Next slide please. We also looked at um, staff medication ranking as well so what they would favour um, from first to last choice and as you can see there but before the intervention Sopoclone um, worn out and then secondary to that was the joint joint first sorry was promethazine and then we had temazepam, melatonin and, and zolpidem afterwards. And then after the intervention, things changed a bit. So his apoclone stayed where it was, which is good. Melatonin increased in favour, um, which obviously there's issues around cost with melatonin and licensing, but it's the only hypnotic we have that actually induces natural sleep. All of the hypnotics, all of the medications that are used to sedate, disturb uh, what's called sleep architecture, which is the way you cycle through different sleep patterns. And sedation is not the same as sleep. So if a medication sedates somebody, it might be harmful to their sleep. Melatonin is the only one that induces natural sleep, although expense and short half-life make it difficult to um, to get good therapeutic outcomes from it at times. Uh, so Mazepam stayed where it was. Promethazine um, fell in favour. Um, so that's, that's good because really promethazine is a drug that's been around since the 1940s. I think often we forget how archaic it is and how dangerous it can be. Um, even though it is sold over the counter, that's only really because it's been grandfathered in in that respect. Um, it was the pro-drug to chlorpromazine, the first antipsychotic, which has horrific side effects. And promethazine is using lots and lots and lots of multiple drug overdoses too. So I think promethazine, you know, when you look at different drugs, people often think benzodiazepines stay away from them. But in reality, I think promethazine is is almost as dangerous, if not if not more so, um, because we're aware of the risks from benzodiazepines and we mitigate against those. But promethazine, I think, in my experience anyway, in practice, very few prescribers understand the risks of it. 
and then Zolpidem again stayed the same, but that's non-formally in our region, so that's understandable it'd be last. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I said before, decrease in the prescribing administration rates, which is good. Um, promethazine use reduced. Um, we also had uh, st a confidence of staff self-confidence rating scores increase, which is good. Um, and then the rank orders of hypnotics changed too. Next slide, please. So we've got some quite good end user feedback from, from this project. So um, especially the trainees said that patients were hypnotics for weeks and weeks, and then we had to stop them immediately at discharge, or in some cases not. This is bad practice. It leaves a mess for both GPs and the patients. Um, it doesn't help with sleep. And um, these interventions created a change in culture so that the mindset for patients that are prescribed hypnotics is now to reduce them during the inpatient stay wherever appropriate. And there's some really good resources in the um, in the handbook about reducing hypnotic doses as sleep effic efficiency increases. So as you improve the cognitive behavioural aspects, as you improve um, the, the sleep hygiene aspects, you can you can titrate down the dose of the hypnotic as you titrate up those those more psychological therapies. Um, so it's challenging to do. It requires a lot of time with the patient, but when you can deliver those things, you really do see an impact in reducing inappropriate prescribing hypnotics. Next slide, please. Similarly, a ward manager said that uh, after watching the video, they started to encourage patients to actually use non-pharmacological methods more, which is really good because. Unfortunately, there was a lot of examples of bad practice on wards where nurses would um, five drug charts, so say patient sleeping, patient sleeping, patient sleeping for weeks and weeks and weeks at, you know, at 10 p.m. for Zopoclone. Well, if the patient's sleeping every night at, at 10 p.m. and you can't give them the hypnotic, should we still be prescribing the hypnotic? Because they've managed to get to sleep without it. Um, often in, as, as a similar kind of uh, similar aspect PRN medications, we made a rule to not give any PRNs up claim before 11 p.m. And that reduced the, the the administration rates massively because why would a patient need it before 11 p.m.? Surely they should be trying to get to sleep without um, pharmacological therapies before then. And if you know, midnight comes by and they still can't sleep, then we can look at, look at assisting with pharmacotherapies. But before 11, it just seems irrational. Um, so this, off, this uh, Encouragement of non-pharmacological methods encourage people to look at um, drug-seeking behaviours and trying to reduce uh, people just coming to the to, to the drug um, to come to the nurses station because they wanted benzodiazepines or zopiclone and things like that, and it, it broke the aspect of drug-seeking behaviour, which is good. Next slide, please. Another point about the um, the, the end user feedback uh, is from a patient here. So. The same guy who'd been on for 22 years without review, last week, three months after he started taking it, um, he's been on lots and lots of different tablets. Um, when he came into uh, to, onto the ward, he was given a lanzapine, which does have, have sedating qualities. So he said he had the best night's sleep in a long time, which I can understand. Um, we then stopped promethazine because he was taking it during the day as well. So it was, it was sedating him. Um, and then he's hoping to come off subclone. Still not sleeping that well at the minute, but we've talked about other things you can do to help, like drinking less alcohol after work, because that impairs sleep. It, it increases, sorry, decreases the sleep latency, so you can get to sleep quicker. But the quality of that sleep will be disrupted throughout the night with frequent awakenings, and you won't get into REM sleep. And then as a consequence of that, the next night, you'll have a REM rebound, so rapid eye movement sleep, in which uh, sleepwalking is, is more common. Um, so alcohol really disrupts, disrupts sleep. And just getting those, those um, messages across to patients really help them manage their own sleep better. Um, we also had a patient who said he didn't like taking Zapoclone because he kept falling asleep in front of the TV and it was really annoying him. So he'd take the medication, fall asleep in front of the TV, then he'd wake up and go to bed and then he couldn't sleep. So we had a patient who had a sleep disorder. We gave him a medication, but we didn't tell him about how to take it. And that made the sleep sort of worse. So, and, and in reality, he probably didn't need Zapoclone, he probably just needed good sleep hygiene measures so that he could get to sleep instead of staying up and watching the TV. Well, if you're tired at that point, go to bed. Anyway, so that's the, the patient feedback there. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the simple, um, a novel and a online educational tool was favorably, favorably, favorably received, it improved staff knowledge, and it was associated with a reduction in hypnotic prescribing rates. We've now got a paper under peer review in the 
psychiatric bulletin to summarise all of that. Um, and if anyone wants a preprint, I'll happily send it around for, for you to read. All of the resources that are there on the CNTW website, um, cntw.nhs.uk forward slash smarter sleep. Really easy to type in there. Um, if you've got any questions, email me. But a real call to action at the end of this is just have a think about every patient you encounter that is on a hypnotic medication or anybody that says they're struggling with sleep. Hypnotics are, are almost very, very likely not to be the answer. And have a think about the other things we can do as pharmacists to recommend not using medication, to recommend psychological therapies too, because ultimately that's how we'll get the best outcomes for patients with poor sleep. Thanks, Wes. Great. Thanks very much, Alan. That's great, great presentation and there are actually some really good results there too. Um, okay, so we'll move on. Uh, Mike McGuire is next. Now, he's not here. He, his presentation has been recorded previously. Mike is the local professional network chair and uh, for the uh, northeastern Yorkshire, one of our two LPN chairs, and he's going to talk about the, the really good work they've been doing um, around antibiotic prescribing in community pharmacy. So we'll start Mike's presentation and let it run through. It's about 10 minutes long. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this presentation on reducing antibiotic prescribing or RAP project. This year's point of care testing through community pharmacy, and it was funded by the Academic Health Sciences Network. My name's Mike McGuire. I'm a community pharmacist by background. I currently have a role with NHS England as local professional network chair. And that role is all about innovation. It's about transformation and it's about positive change. So when the opportunity came to work with the Academic Health Sciences Network on this project, I jumped at a chance and became project lead. So today I'm covering the RAP project and I want to focus on six different aspects of the RAP project. First of all, I want to look at the problem, or in this case, two of the problems. I also want to cover one of the solutions, which is indeed the reducing antibiotic prescribing or RAP project. I'd like to look at the purpose of the RAP project, what we're aiming to achieve from this. Also how we went about it and what we did. I obviously want to look at the outcomes of the RAP project and then I want to finish off with the next steps. The first of the challenges that I'd like to consider is that of antimicrobial resistance. Now I'm not suggesting that one small project in Middlesbrough is going to make a massive difference and have an impact on a global scale. However, we do need to consider this as a serious challenge and start taking steps to address this problem in whatever form they come in. Because a failure to address this could result in an estimated 10 million deaths each year globally by the year 2050. Wow, that's a scary thought. When you think of the devastation that COVID has sadly caused us, we really need to start thinking about addressing this problem of AMR very seriously and very urgently. The next challenge I'd like to consider is that of workload in general practice and anyone who works with or close to general practice will know that they're coming under increasing pressure and that time and capacity is a real issue for them. Now, Einstein's definition of insanity is repeating the same behaviours and expecting a different outcome. Now, bearing in mind the challenges that I've just described, we have got to start working differently. But having said that, it's very easy to say, yeah, we've got to start working differently. We've got to start working smarter. We need to think outside the box. But it's very difficult to actually translate that in a real tangible practical application of working differently. However, the RAP project does exactly that. It utilizes the skills of community pharmacy teams working in partnership with general practice teams to create a new patient pathway. So the purpose of the RAP project was threefold. First of all, we wanted to test if we could influence a reduction in the levels of antibiotic prescribing. Secondly, we wanted to test if we could safely channel shift inappropriate patients away from the GP to reduce workload and increase time and capacity in general practice. And then thirdly, we wanted to test if we could give all patients involved in the project including those who do genuinely need antibiotics, 
a more effective pathway and a better patient experience. So how do we aim to achieve this? Well, we're working with two general practices in Middlesbrough using three community pharmacies. Patients with a chesty cough who phone a general practice for an appointment and potentially antibiotics are referred into the pharmacy for a CRP point of care test and a private consultation with the pharmacist. For those of you who aren't familiar with CRP, it stands for C-reactive protein. It's a substance produced by the liver in response to a stimulus. Under certain conditions, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, which would lead to high levels of CRP anyway. So we had to use exclusion criteria. But once that had been taken into account, those patients with a chest cough who had a high level of CRP, this would likely indicate potential bacterial infection. Those patients with low levels of CRP would indicate either a viral infection or no infection at all. So the pharmacy team took a finger prick of blood from each patient and then determined the levels of markers of inflammation. And this guided the decision as to whether or not antibiotics were appropriate, along with history taken by the pharmacist during the consultation with the patient. And then the patients then managed in the pharmacy or the pharmacist liaised with the general practice to take the necessary action, including, if necessary, the issuing and dispensing of an antibiotic prescription. So how have we designed the service? Well, as you can see there, we used a variety of people, stakeholders to give input into the design of the service. In particular, NESCA, which stands for Northeast Social Care and Health Advisors, a patient-based organisation um, with people from organisations such as Health Watchers and patient participation groups. They were really helpful. And also the reception team in the general practice had a really valuable role in service design in terms of the process and the patient pathway. And what this led us to have was whole team engagement throughout all stakeholders who really felt included in the process and they helped to refine the patient journey. And of course, this led to a feeling of ownership across all stakeholders, which was great to see. They built mutual common goals and they really wanted to see the project succeed. They displayed shared leadership and pride in each other's success. And what we found was actually building relationships between the healthcare professionals was an added bonus for the whole project. So what were the outcomes for this? Well, this is to me is a really exciting part of this presentation. And I can't say that any academic will tell me that 123 people referred in during the project isn't a big enough sample size to really draw any proper conclusions. But even though I appreciate that, I can't help getting excited at some of these results because out of the 123 referred, 29 patients got advice only, and that was good enough for them. 12 got advice on the sale of a medicine. 71 got advice and simple linkers issued. Now, I know that's gonna be making some of you smile because it sort of goes against the direction of travel, doesn't it? But that idea actually came from the reception team and also independently from the patient group who both said they knew the demographics of the area and they said there's going to be certain people that if they leave the pharmacy with nothing, they will walk straight back into the general practice and demand antibiotics. So we didn't incentivize pharmacists for supplying this. It was purely reimbursement at one pound per bottle of simple linctus. And we just asked the pharmacist to use their discretion and give it if they thought it was really needed in that situation. The really exciting figure is this eight that were referred back to the GP. Four of those eight were referred back for red flags and only four were referred back because I had a high CRP reading. So only four prescriptions were issued for antibiotics out of 123 patients. And I can't help thinking that's pretty staggering really. And then finally, the final figure was three people were classified as other because they returned for a second test after three days because the first test was inconclusive, it was a bit in the middle. So they returned back for a second test. So let's get some feedback from patients. Okay, first of all, 
pharmacist, very good. Quick negative test, reassuring process, like it. Next, lot better, safe trip to GP, like to get results straight away, got antibiotics, great. I need to stop smoking, very good test, went well. It might make pharmacists too busy doing all these tests. And the final one, quite good idea. Link to given, it's done the trick. Saves GP time. That's an interesting comment, isn't it? Link to given, it's done the trick. I'll tell you what, I'd far rather link to being given as a placebo and doing the trick than antibiotics being given as a placebo and doing the trick. But interesting comment anyway. So let's have a look back to the purpose of the RAP project. Now, first of all, we're looking to test to see if we can influence a reduction in the levels of antibiotic prescribing. And I've got, say, four prescriptions for antibiotics out of 123 patients, speaks for itself. Secondly, we wanted to test if we can safely channel shift inappropriate patients away from the GP to reduce workload and increase time and capacity in general practice. And again, out of 123 patients, 115 were managed safely and successfully in the pharmacy. And then finally, we wanted to test if we can give all patients involved in the project, including those who do genuinely need antibiotics, a more effective pathway and a better patient experience. And again, we got feedback from patients who did need antibiotics and also patients who didn't need antibiotics and both were really positive. Unfortunately, the next steps of this project have been paused due to the implications in terms of COVID of referring a patient with a chesty cough into a pharmacy. It's no longer appropriate in the current circumstances. However, there's still a potential in future to further explore the opportunities that this project has created, both in terms of reducing antibiotic prescribing and increasing time and capacity in general practice, and also, quite importantly, giving patients a better experience and a better patient journey. I'm just going to leave you with my contact details. My email is mike.maguire2 at nhs.net. Feel free to get in touch with me about this project or any other project. And I'd like to finish off by thanking the Academic Health Sciences Network for their support throughout this project. Thanks very much. Up next is Joe Brayson from Northumbria Healthcare. And Joe's going to be talking about a novel way of tackling the inappropriate prescribing of antibiotics. So sticking with the antibiotics, um, theme, I'll hand over to Joe. Hi there, my name's Joe. I'm one of the pharmacists at Northumbria Healthcare, and I'm here to talk to you today about my antibiotic cafe project. I'd just like to say a big thank you to AHSM before I get started for their contribution to this project. Uh, without their help, it wouldn't have been possible. So the Antibiotic Cafe is an antimicrobial stewardship project at heart, and I'm sure you don't need me to tell you the significance of antimicrobial resistance as a global issue. The current estimations um, show that the UK's antimicrobial usage um, is approximately 25% inappropriate. So we still have a lot of work that we can do here um, to improve this. And all the projections are rather bleak, unfortunately. Um, so by 2050, it's estimated that 10 million deaths a year will be attributed to resistance and that there'll be an approximate uh, expenditure of 50 billion pounds a year globally on this problem. Um, so it's something that we need to act upon now to make a difference. More relevant to this project is the um, figures regarding palliative care and the usage of antibiotics. So as with all um, antimicrobial stewardship figures, there's quite a lot of variation due to the subject of nature. But this uh, one study, which is one that's quite commonly uh, quoted, um, shows that there's somewhere around 40% inappropriate antibiotic usage within palliative care. Um, up to 25% of patients are receiving antibiotics on the day of their death. Um, so there's a significant amount of work to be done with it, specifically within palliative care and audits that we've run within Northumbria show a similar um, level of inappropriate antibiotic usage. So it's something that we wanted to address in-house as well as um, something that needs to be addressed on a wider scale. 
So it was decided this would be our area of focus, antimicrobial stewardship in end of life care. We set up a multidisciplinary steering group, including palliative care consultants, microbiologists, pharmacists, uh, nursing staff and patients because we were really keen to get patient involvement in this project and get their views and opinions on it. And together we decided the focus would be challenging prescriptions for antimicrobials within this area, discussing treatment escalation plans and raising awareness of them, increasing general awareness of resistance and discussing the ethical difficulties surrounding having these conversations with patients and families within this yeah. clinical area. And these are all really big topics and topics which traditionally have been traditionally have been quite difficult to do formal teaching around because they're such emotive um, topics for staff and patients to discuss. And um, so we wanted to try and do it in a easier, more digestible way. And the idea that we landed on was that of a, a learning cafe. So for those of you who don't know, a learning cafe is essentially a peer to peer learning event where um, staff, patients, anyone who attends can sit down in a cafe environment. They can have tea, coffee, lunch, whatever, and they discuss a clinical topic. So for us, the clinical topic was um, antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and they do that in a very informal, self-directed way. We adopted what's called the, the World Cafe model. So the World Cafe model is essentially a set of guidance which um, sets out how to run an effective learning cafe, what tips and tricks you can use to help you. So we adopted that as our um, model for the cafe. And the whole point of creating that environment is to essentially disarm people, make them feel more comfortable and uh, create an environment where they feel like they can discuss more difficult topics such as um, uh, such as antimicrobial stewardship in end of life care. But what's really important is that they have some guidance as to what to discuss. So that's where the questions come in. So the questions are posed to the attendants um, for them to discuss and to guide their discussion around that area. So we developed a question pack, so a physical pack of cards which you spread around the tables and then the attendants can turn those question cards over at random or they can pick the ones they think are good um, and they structure their discussion around those questions and the questions were designed to tackle those issues that we identified within our steering group, so around challenging prescriptions and raising awareness and discussing the um, ethical uh, dilemmas around it and we had some fantastic uh, discussions come out of that we had um, senior consultants talking to patients about what their wishes would be if they were approaching the end of life um, and in then comparing that to how the patients felt discussions they had 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 gone and there were some really interesting dynamics which emerged as a result of the questions. So using those questions, we ran a number of events in-house, first of all, so within Northumbria, and we ran them as uh, learning at lunch events. So um, we provided tea, coffee and lunch for the participants, which was quite important, and I'll come on to that. Um, and we got a really good attendance and a really wide range of different staff and patients coming to those events. So um, senior and junior clinicians, non-clinical staff and patients all came and we intentionally set the table so that they all mixed together and um, we had loads of different views from loads of different levels of seniority essentially around these things and it was really nice to see those discussions taking place and we then took the cafe um, to a wider audience so we attended the clinical pharmacy congress um, where we actually ran a virtual cafe or a number of virtual cafes over the whole event and again, we had um, quite good attendance with a load with different mixes of staff coming there. And we are currently in discussion with um, NHS England, Scotland and Wales about running a national event to coincide with World Antibiotic Awareness Week in 2021. Um, so we're thinking about how that would work on a virtual platform 
or um, run as lots of small events within different hospitals and how we could distribute the material. And as a result of all of these discussions, we've actually had quite a bit of interest from various trusts around the country. So we've sent um, card packs, both physical and virtual, to um, trusts within Yorkshire, to down south to Buckinghamshire. Um, so uh, the, the, there is quite good uptake um, from people wanting to try this method as a new way to approach what's often been quite a difficult um, topic to train on and to uh, broach with staff. So we've had really good responses from the cafes we've run so far. The feedback that, that we've received from the people who attended has been um, overwhelmingly positive. So there's a few sort of quotes on the screen. Um, I'd particularly like to draw your attention to the one on the right there. Um, so this is actually a quote from one of the patients who attended the cafes who um, felt very grateful to be able to give something back to the NHS, which is something I didn't expect. I, I felt I was imposing on them to ask them to come, but actually they really enjoyed the events. They felt they could and um, they were listened to by a wide range of clinicians and non-clinical staff um, and they were really able to contribute and felt like they could make a difference. And then similarly, the one on the bottom is actually from a paediatric consultant who attended one of the cafes who came back to me um, uh, quite a while after the event had happened and said it really has changed their practice and made them think differently and uh, they referred to a specific quite difficult conversation with the child's family where they did talk about the negative implications of giving antibiotics as well as um, the, the potential benefits and it did change the things for um, that child and that family um, for the better so it was really nice to, to hear that feedback from them. So at the end of all this, what we have is essentially a, a model, a training package, which um, we can use to raise awareness, to change the way people are thinking around antimicrobial stewardship within palliative care, but also in the wider context. But it's been a journey to get here. There's been a learning process. And if I was to speak to someone who is interested in running one of these within their organization, so whether that's an NHS trust or wherever, um, I think my first thing would be don't skimp on the lunch. So it was difficult at first to get people to be interested when we were running this on a small scale. Um, and I think one of the main selling points was the fact that there was lunch provided. You know, there's no two ways about it. If we're asking staff to give up time in the middle of their working day, we need to make it uh, seem worth their while. Once you have pe uh, people there, they love the event. They think it's really interesting. and um, Everyone reported that they got a lot from it, but getting them there in the first place can be a challenge. So that would be my main advice is uh, don't skimp on the lunch. Thanks very much for your time um, listening today. If you do have any questions or if anyone is interested in running a cafe themselves, please let me know. Um, my email address is on the screen there and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Joe. I know you're on the call there, even though the presentation was um, pre-recorded. So fantastic piece of work. Again, another great example of using tackling an old problem with some new innovative thinking. Very good. And, yeah, wish you all the best with that. Um, Joe's on, so please do ask him questions if you want to. OK, so next up is Paul. Hi, Paul. Uh, Paul Davies from the Forest Lawn Medical Group, um, who's going to be talking about really good work he's been doing around COPD exacerbations in primary care. Thanks Paul. Good afternoon and thank you very much to the uh, Academic Health Science Network for the invitation to come and talk to you about a project which looked at the management of COPD exacerbations in primary care. My name is Paul Davies, I'm a pharmacist in Forest Hall in North Pineside. I also work as a director of pharmacy for a primary care network in north in northwest of North Pineside and as the primary care engagement lead for the National Institute for Health Research in Northeast and North Cumbria. So why are we interested in acute exacerbations of COPD? Well, we know that they're a common cause for admission. So the one in eight emergency admissions in the UK is uh, a consequence of an acute exacerbation. So it's the second most common cause for emergency hospital in, in England. 
exacerbations are associated with increased mortality, accelerated decline in lung function, and impaired quality of life. And as you can see from this slide, the, there are myriad causes for acute exacerbations from infection. Um, the most common infective agent is a virus rather than a bacterium. Um, it can be poor adherence to medicines. It can be inflammatory response. It can be pollution. And also importantly, it can be to do with mental health issues, i.e. anxiety, depression. Um, often people who are breathless for prolonged periods have a very high association with mental health difficulties. The majority of exacerbations are managed in primary care, often using a combination of steroids and antibiotics. Concerns have been raised over a number of years that patients might not be, not, might not be using rescue packs appropriately, and this could lead to harm. So we know that steroids lead to increased risk of harm, including pneumonia and osteoporosis when they're used inappropriately. And we're well aware of the risks associated with antimicrobial stewardship. So really, we've said, on the one hand, there are lots of different possible causes for acute exacerbations, but we seem to over-rely on just two different types of treatment. So we started out looking for, I guess, people to work with. So myself and Regan McCahill, who's a pre-reg pharmacist in a practice last year, um, reached out and we, we enlisted Professor Stephen Burke and Dr. Carlos Echevarria, who are respiratory consultants from the, R, uh, the RBI and Northumbria, to work with us. And Sue Hart, who is um, a respiratory nurse by background, but also works with the Academic Health Science Network now, agreed to work together as a team. And um, I guess what we said is, well, what's achievable in a short period of time? Uh, and we thought the best thing we could do would be to, to work out what, what's currently out there, what do people do in terms of guidelines and processes? Uh, and then how does this compare with best practice? Unfortunately, this started right when um, the first lockdown kicked in. So the original plan was to develop an educational intervention that could be delivered at practice level. Um, but because we weren't allowed in practices, we um, changed our process, of our plan a little bit, and rather than going into practices to deliver um, an educational intervention, we agreed that we would uh, ask questionnaires of the practices to, to gauge what cu current practice was. Uh, and unfortunately, at the time, the PCN just kicked off, and we had eight willing pharmacists who were willing to uh, get, get involved and help us out. So our first challenge was to work out what best practice would look like in terms of rescue pack guidance. And we used nice gold local guidance and all sorts of other bits and bobs to help inform our um, opinion. So we think that people should be told which medicines they use, uh, sh which medicines should be used. Uh, patients should be educated on uh, how to recognize an exacerbation, um, help them to develop a proper plan. There should be a, a a systematic way of recording exacerbations, um, clear guidance about when people need to be reviewed by a doctor, by a nurse, by a specialist, and also what you know should rescue packs be on repeat? Should they be on acute? Should should they be automatically triggered by patient need, etc. So, assessing local and national guidance against our criteria, nobody did very well. Um, everybody seemed to give people advice about what medicine should be included in a rescue pack. But against all of the criteria, the um, local and national guidance was found lacking. So then we shared a questionnaire with each of the nine practices in the PCN to try and understand what their process was in terms of the supply of medicines. Um, should it be on repeat? Do you provide education to the patients? How do you choose medicines? Do you monitor the use of medicines? What, what number of issues triggers a referral into secondary care? Um, and do you conduct a review after each rescue pack, after a certain number? And how do you give, it, how do you give advice about steroids? And what we found was that there's a huge variety of processes involved in the supply of rescue pack medicines. So bearing in mind, this is a group of nine practices covering a population of about 71,000 in a 
relatively small geographical area with not a huge difference in demographics. Um, people seem to be doing things very differently. And whether this is to do with the uh, slide and the, the guidance and guidelines that are out there, we're not sure, but that's certainly something we want to look into going forward. So then we started to think, okay, well, what, what does this mean in practice? How many people are affected by acute exacerbations in, in, in our patch? This data comes from the NHS Business Services Authority Respiratory Dashboard, and it shows you that across the nine practices, there are hundreds of episodes of acute exacerbation per year in North Tyneside, in Northwest North Tyneside particularly. And what's interesting about this type of chart is it shows you there's a small proportion of people in each practice who are receiving over 12 rescue packs per year. So everybody on this graph is in the at-risk group because everybody on this graph is receiving more than three rescue packs of steroid prescription in a 12-month period. So that's, that's, a, that's an amazing finding. And we looked at the data from the National COPD Audit, which was conducted in Wales uh, a couple of years ago now, three years ago now. And they suggest that about nearly 15% of patients had more than two exacerbations per year. So it sounds like, we, although we've got probably slightly higher numbers in the Northeast, this is not that unusual. So going back to our aims, really, I think we've done well to, to establish a group of uh, high-profile clinicians who are interested in looking at this area in primary care. Um, we've established that there are gaps in local and national guidelines using the criteria we established. And we've also looked at the current processes for rescue pack use across the northwest and north Tyneside. So the next steps for us, really, I guess we, we need to explore a bit more about the, the changes in prescribing between practices. So is that to do with size? Is that to do with demographics? What are the themes that are reaching out to us? And then, really, what, what's the impact of uh, an intervention? So we're already looking at uh, the CCGs as part of their prescribing engagement scheme this year in North Hindside. The for uh, each of the practices to look at people who are prescribed three or more rescue packs over a 12-month period. The idea really being to, is there a knowledge gap from patients about understanding their harms and benefits and when to take their rescue pack appropriately? We're halfway through that at the moment and hopefully report on that next year. We could do with really some kind of proper uh, evaluation of benefits and harms from steroids and antibiotics, and then what kind of patient level intervention would really help um, drive that behavioral change. There are currently a couple of really interesting trials ongoing about helping patients to identify then th their need for either a steroid or an antibiotic through the use of uh, point of care testing. Um, and, and going back to our earlier slide where we said there's a multifactorial cause for uh, acute exacerbations, the question is, is there something we can do to help point people down the right path? So can we identify a, a more eosinophilic type of COPD that would benefit from a steroid? Can we identify patients who might benefit from other medicines or other types of therapy? So a very interesting area to look at. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to any questions. Brilliant. So thanks, Paul. Uh, gr great to shine the spotlight on this really important piece of work and will really be interesting to see how some of your interventions um, do. Um, OK, so next up, we have uh, Lewis Sutherland um, from the Frumbury Healthcare, um, who's going to be talking about um, uh, a proactive approach to bone health and the work he did about identifying people with risk of fracture and how they were supported. Okay, Lewis. Um, sorry, Lewis's presentation is recorded as well, but I think he is on the on the call and will answer your questions in the chat box. Hello, my name 
Farms Lewis Sutherland. I am the Senior Clinical Pharmacist for Rheumatology at Northumbria. And this presentation is about a proactive approach to bone health, looking at the Academic Health Science Network project I was involved in last year. So for a bit of background, osteoporosis is a condition where the bones are more brittle and more likely to break when they're exposed to a stress. This can lead to fragility fractures, which is where a fracture happens with a force that it would not expect to be enough to cause a break. So if someone got hit by a car, we'd expect them to break some bones. But if someone fell from a seated position onto a carpet, we would not expect them to break. It is caused by lower bone mass, which can be due to several things, such as low peak bone density, which is the greatest um, bone density a person will achieve in their lifetime, and is reached between the ages of 20 and 30. And increased bone turnover, which can be due to different medical conditions or medications, such as glucocorticoid therapy, or poor mineralization of bone, which can be due to malabsorption or reduced intake of calcium and vitamin D. So osteoporosis is a concern for several reasons. There's the cost perspective, as the direct cost of an osteoporotic neck of femur fracture is about £16,000. And that doesn't take into account the follow-up social care costs, as one in two patients will lose independence and need long-term care and support. And there's also a 25% chance of mortality at one year following an osteoporotic hip fracture. From a quality of life perspective, obviously all fractures are painful, but with vertebral fractures, it can actually cause loss of height, which is quite a big concern for a lot of patients and severe long term back pain and deformity. And the main fracture sites are the hip, vertebrae, wrist, ankle and shoulder. So for the HSN Bone Health Project, it was carried out alongside the Primary Care Commission Service for Falls and Fracture. Uh, this was a, a service the GPs had already signed up to, so it promoted uh, GP buy in. And with the North East and North Cumbria, uh, bone health is a, has been a focus in, in recent years. Uh, the data from 2014-2015 showed it as a bit of an outlier uh, with high rates for admission with falls and admission with hip fracture in the age group of 65 and above. And there were 15 GP practices that signed up to this primary care commission service and um, with the aim that we would optimise bone health in those practices and specifically identify patients who were at risk of osteoporosis and fracture who hadn't been identified through usual models of care. And usual models of care um, have been reactive when someone's had a fracture or opportune through identification of patients who may be high risk of osteoporosis. This could be your annual COPD and rheumatoid arthritis reviews and secondary care identifying patients for bone health assessment and DEXA with particular conditions. So patients were identified using the radar healthcare intelligence tool. It's readily available data and radar has Q fracture built into it, which is one of the two validated fracture risk assessment tools in the UK, the other one being FRAX, which is often more well known. And Q fracture takes into account falls risk as well as osteoporosis risk. So it will count things such as SSRI therapy, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and things such like that as part of its calculation. And for every patient identified by radar, and this was uh, over the age of 15 with a Q fracture score of 10% or greater, um, I applied a holistic clinical review to determine if any further action was needed to remove some noise from the data. And by noise, I mean patients who either were not suitable to contact, they might have been approaching end of life, but still flagged on radar due to risk factors, or it could have been someone who flagged up because they had falls risk, but didn't actually have any osteoporotic risk factors, therefore they weren't at any higher risk of osteoporosis than other patients. And I called these patients who identified as needing further action to discuss either a referral for a bone density scan at DEXA or for a starting treatment or for a review of a drug holiday, be that starting a drug holiday or restarting treatment following a drug holiday. And I cycled through the different GP practices while waiting for DEXA results and blood results to come back. And any DEXs um, that came back were actioned by myself and follow-up was carried out with such a starting treatment and then documenting in the notes via either recalls or scheduled tasks for when repeat DEXs were due or when bisphosphonate holiday reviews uh, were due. 
So if the outcome data, um, the total list size, which is the total number of patients in all the practices combined, was almost 94,000 patients. And out of this group, about 4,000 patients were identified by radar as having been over the age of 50 and having a Q fracture score greater than 10%. And I identified about a third of those patients were actually uh, genuinely in need of further uh, investigation or treatment. So, and I say just under half of those, about 45%, either declined further investigation or treatment, or they weren't actually eligible. And this could be someone who had, for example, a wrist fracture documented in their medical notes. But when I contacted them, it was very clear it was a trauma fracture, not a fragility fracture. And if they had no other major osteoporotic risk factors, then it didn't need any further follow up at that time. So there would have been 620 DEXs booked with 324 treatments estimated to be commenced. And of the DEXs that did come back, uh, almost 30% did show um, clinical osteoporosis uh, judged with a T-score of minus 2.5 at the femoral neck. So other outcomes, I held education sessions with respiratory nurse specialists in primary and secondary care um, to cover the, the risks of COPD with osteoporosis. And this includes that most patients will either be current or ex-smokers, they may have frequent steroid rescue packs, and many patients are sort of lower mobility due to breathlessness, and all of these things can increase the, the osteoporosis and hence the fracture risk. We did a care home bisphosphonate audit looking at the administration of bisphosphonates in care homes and in any care homes where this wasn't optimal uh, i worked with the the technicians that we have who go into those care homes to uh, work with the the staff there to make sure that we could we could correct any any issues there uh, i developed a primary care network pharmacist education session uh, which will be delivered to allow the work to be carried on by primary care network pharmacists so this project isn't just a, a flash in the pan. I'm currently supporting the West Northumberland primary care network with a bisphosphonate and denosumab recall project to make sure these patients are managed correctly. Uh, I also developed uh, new clinical networks. I joined the regional advisory board for bone health and also gained link with specialists involved in bone health associated with hormone deprivation therapy which is in patients on treatment for breast and prostate cancer. So the main learning points, obviously, uh, there are many patients who had significant fracture risk that weren't picked up by usual care. Um, I also found that osteoporotic risk factors, generally speaking, a lot of primary care bone health reviews are poorly understood. And there was quite a big variation in the bisphosphonate holiday recall and review between different practices. And this largely came down to several practices had recently put in a project specifically tackling this issue and clearing up all the coding and recalls. Practices hadn't uh, got around to doing that, and that was the main reason for that. Uh, I work with different G I work with GP practice admin teams for booking appointments was hugely beneficial. Uh, so we tried the cold call method and I found that patients were sometimes a bit sceptical, worried it might have been a scam, um, particularly because I was a name that hadn't been previously associated with a practice before. However, when the GP practices uh, booked patients in for appointments with me, uh, it took away any of these concerns. That allowed me to be a lot more efficient with booking in my clinics, particularly when working between multiple different GP practices. What we also found was quite good was the AQRX text messaging service where patients would be sent a text message with an opt-out appointment with me uh, where they would then contact the practices they didn't want to attend and this was quite good for again very efficient for the practice um, and also very efficient for me and um, booking the appointments knowing who would be available. Uh, the main risk factors that are sort of poorly understood were actually the secondary osteoporotic risk factors and I'm going to highlight two particular ones here the COPD and inflammatory bowel disease, as within 10 and 40% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease will have osteoporosis, but the number who underwent a fracture risk assessment was much lower than that. And the FRAC system built into system one, another learning point is it's largely inaccurate, uh, mainly because it will pick up fractures patients have had previously with word fragility, for example, a finger, and record that as a score, so potentially overestimate patients, but also it wouldn't uh, account in any secondary osteoporotic risk factors and the smoking and alcohol status is often incorrect because it will take you from a snapshot at time which won't currently be how the patient is or what they currently intake. So positives, it was well received um, by the practices and by the patients. 
and we employed quality improvement and methodology through PDSA throughout the project. And how this was particularly good was due to the sheer number of patients we could apply fracture risk factors to the radar data to just bring down the number of view reviews I had to carry out in the later practices. Uh, the initial meetings with each practice uh, were very good because they built a rapport with the practice staff and with the practice manager and the GPs mainly who I was going to be working with on the project and everyone was aware of what responsibilities everyone had and what work I'd be carrying out and it meant we had a very good communication and it was very accessible people knowing who I was and also this wasn't a, a task heavy project like similar bone health projects have been in the past it was very much I was taking on the work from start to finish and also I was able to be quite flexible with the different practices through having this meeting learning what they like to do with the recalls and follow-ups so I could amend my practice or amend what I did for each different practice to what suited them best to allow them to carry on this work themselves with any later tasks such as bisphosphonate reviews in five years time. And we obviously did adapt the, adapt the project due to, due to COVID when the DEXA services were turned off and we managed to do this uh, quite seamlessly for the time when the project was carrying on. So I mean challenges, uh, the demographics were a big challenge um, with having practices anywhere from Berwick to Hot Whistle because there was a, a logistical thought process of when to review each practice based on when winter would be coming around and trying to guess what appointment dates patients may have for DEXAs to save them travelling on icy roads if they were going to be at Berwick and have to travel to Wandsbeck or from somewhere like Hot Whistle and then travelling to North Tyneside for example. It was a multi-step process given that we had the DEXA scans and the blood appointments when the DEXA results came back. So you couldn't just do one practice and close the book on that practice. You'd be review all the patients from one practice and contact them and then start reviewing the patients for the second practice while waiting for the DEXAs to come back and then start reviewing for the third practice while waiting for the first and second and so on and so forth. And obviously COVID was a challenge as with um, many other services and we amended to account. Thank you very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Brilliant. So thank you to Lewis for recording that presentation for us. And again, like in the chat box, he can answer any of your questions. Really important piece of work and you know, some good results there, Lewis. So thank you. OK, so last, but definitely not least up, is um, Dr Rory McKinnon. Uh, uh, Rory is in numerous number of hats actually. He's uh, in Sunderland. He's a clinical director at Sunderland North PCN. He's medical director at the GP Alliance in Sunderland. Um, in Sunderland, they've been doing some fantastic work um, around reducing opioids and and work that's um, you know made, made national headlines around um, uh, the the campaign they they ran. The, painkillers don't exist. Now, and, and, and today Rory's going to give us the GP's perspective on, on the use of opioids. So we'll play that recording now, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rory McKinnon. I'm a GP from Bridgeview Medical Group in Southwick. And today I'm going to talk to you about the use of opioids from a GP's perspective. Just a little bit about me. I'm a full-time GP who works in a busy, deprived inner city practice. I'm not a substance misuse expert or a GP with special interests. And today I'll be talking to you about prescribed opioid use. There are some really important key caveats to today's presentation, particularly that we're talking about opioids in the context of chronic non-cancer pain. What we're not talking about is opioids in other circumstances, and that's because they do have a place, particularly for the treatment of acute cancer and end of life pain. Equally, whilst we're not directly covering gabapentinoids, many of the issues and risks with those drugs are similar to that of opioids. So why are opioids used? It's a really important question and it's one that we need to understand when we're discussing them with patients. Often opioids are used because, they're, because we've been told or they've been marketed as or we've presented them in many forums as painkillers. So people take them for pain in the belief that they will reduce their pain. But as we know, opioids are at best pain modulators, not painkillers. And they may mask it, but equally they may cause pain. But it's an important question to understand. So why the concern? 
Well, concerns around the world are escalating about the long-term effects of opioids. There are many side effects, and below I've listed some. I particularly draw your attention to tolerance, addiction, hyperalgesia, and increased mortality. The important thing with hyperalgesia is explaining to patients that these opioids or painkillers could actually, ironically, be causing pain. And again, that's something that's really important to explain. It's a difficult concept. It certainly was difficult for me to fully understand when I started doing this work. So it, I can understand how it could be difficult for others. So it's about understanding that clearly for yourself so you can un explain that to patients. Additionally, there are concerns because of the increased risk of death associated with opioids, which is even worse when they're simultaneous use between opioids and gabapentinoids. Equally, there's been changes to the law. So laws have changed in reflection, on reflection, based on the concerns of opioid use. For example, with drug driving, it is now illegal in England and Wales to drive if you're impaired by drugs, even if those are prescribed. And that was introduced in 2015. Pregabalin, gabapentin were made Schedule 3 drugs in 2019 and tramadol relatively recently in 2014. Sunderland is one of the areas prescribed more opioids than others, but the reasons for this are likely to be multifactorial, not just prescribing habits. Sunderland's had a heavy industrial past, and it's also sometimes opioids are linked to deprivation. So when we have these conversations and when we discuss about how to approach it, it's more than just trying to change uh, the GP's prescribing habits. Actually, it's about looking at a wider picture. And that's what led the CCG to develop a Painkillers Don't Exist campaign. So this campaign was designed to, to work with patients and clinicians to explain how long-term pain medications don't necessarily help with pain. They often mask it or they cause side effects that are worse than the problem originally. It's easy to say to, be, uh, to clinicians, just stop prescribing them. But that's a diff difficult thing because we also have to provide resources because it's very difficult to just stop prescribing something if you don't really know why or what you can do instead. So we produce some resources. So there's some for if you're a GP and there's some for a pharmacist and there's a localized resource depending whether you're from Sunderland or from County Durham. So I undertook some work to try to reduce our opioid prescribing at my practice in 2018. So this is from my own experience. This is what I did. I'm not saying it's the only way to do things, but it's just something that I found helpful. So I thought I would share it. The first thing is to get engagement, engage with your practice. You need to have practice support with the clinicians, agree prescribing and de-prescribing principles. You don't want people doing different things because it's confusing for the patients. And then patients will also move around between clinicians hoping for different answers. I worked with colleagues from a neighboring practice to develop a letter that we sent to patients that outlined the long-term risks of opioids. We explained also the legal ramifications and so we sent this to patients. Now we sent it in staged letter, in staged groups and that's simply because if you're going to send the letter, you need to be able to respond when patients come back to you and discuss it. So I wanted to be able to review those patients. So I sent them in batches that I could therefore manage. We started with tramadol as a, grip, a, a drug class, and then we moved on from that. Equally, once we'd managed any of the queries that came from letters, we then asked our reception team to signpost patients on long-term opioids to me for an analgesia review whenever they ordered an acute or repeat prescription, obviously considering the caveats outlined at the beginning. So you've done all this work. And now patients are coming in to come and see you for an opioid review or an analgesia review. The most important thing is to be clear and explain the purpose. So I always kept a copy of the letter that we sent to hand because that letter was written with a clear outline of what the concerns were, why, and what we were suggesting we could do about it. So it was always helpful to, to have that and also meant the patients knew that we were going to cover many of the points in, those le in the letter already. Take a pain history, find out why they're taking the opioids in the first place. Is it from a pain long time ago? Is it from a new pain? Is, you know, is, are they on the right 
analgesia for that pain, it's very important to take a full history and also try to understand their ideas, concerns and expectations. Because at the end, when you're trying to do a shared decision making plan, you need to understand those bits. Discuss the pros and cons of each analgesic, not just the opioids. If they're on a combined use of opioids, agree which one you're going to wean and stop first. And that might be that you ask the patient, which of these two would you like to reduce first or which one's the most beneficial? Sometimes, or quite a lot of time, you'll get told, well, neither of them really work. Or if they're just on opioids, well, the opioids don't really work. And I say, okay, let's try and reduce them. But when they're on both, I'd just reduce one at a time. I never try to reduce multiple analgesics at the same time, because if they get a pain flare, you don't know which one was helping. I used to say to patients, you get roughly a rule of threes. You get a third of people who you can reduce and this pain is no different. It's not better, it's not worse. Then you've got the third who find that actually their pain gets better um, or they get less side effects. And that might be because of the side effects of the medication are worse than the problem or because they were getting hyperalgesia. And then there's about a third of patients where you reduce the analgesics and the pain gets worse. But I always say to patients, like, it's hard to know which group you're going to be in. And two thirds of people are not going to be worse off. So isn't that worth trying? It's important, therefore, to discuss alternatives as well. So including psychological therapy. So it might be that actually we need to try a different um, analgesic or we need to try a different treatment regime. Or it might be that we stop, let's reduce them down and then we'll reevaluate. Discuss your weaning program. So I used to always go slow and steady. There was no race to finish quickly because you need to have patient support and engagement. And if you reduce too quickly and start getting withdrawal effects, you'll lose that engagement. So I used to set realistic goals and then offer lots of support with easy contact. So I used to say, right, why don't over the next month we reduce by X? And then if you're doing okay, over the next month we'll reduce by X again. And, but if there's a problem, just give me a call. Well, and we'll have a chat about it and see if we can sort something out. I used to say, sometimes there'll be bumps in the road that happens, you might have a pain flare. And if that happens, don't worry, just go back up to the last dose that you were comfortable at. And then we'll give it a couple of weeks and then we'll try it and start it again. And remember, the main aim here is to reduce to a point where the pain is manageable. It's not about trying to get to a point where patients are pain free. And I used to say that at the very beginning, I don't think it will be necessarily realistic to be pain free. What we're hoping for is to get your pain to be manageable with the fewest number of side effects and the safest long-term risk profile. So that's a little bit about kind of the work that I've done. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. Um, a really important subject and some fantastic work going on in Sunderland, Sunderland um, around this. Around this. Do look at the website. I posted the link in there. Um, just just a note that the HSN are also um, doing some work around opioid um, interventions and looking at uh, what could be an effective opioid intervention. And their their work called the Crop Project is um, uh, you can find that in the link that's that's been posted up there by Sarah now. Okay, so that's fantastic. Thank you very much to all our speakers. What a uh, brilliant presentation, some fantastic projects, really impacting on patient care and patient safety. I, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, please do think about what you can take from today and what you can you know, adapt or iterate and put into your own, um, in own settings. And, and actually, can, can, you, can you support your patients by using some of the ideas you've heard of today? To contact our speakers, we've all offered up and um, offered offered support to, and sharing their ideas and sharing their resources. So that would be really good. I have got a plea from Sarah from the HSN that the, uh, there will be a survey link posted uh, on this straight after this um, presentation. So please take part in the feedback survey. Let us know how what went well. Let us know what didn't go so well and what you'd like to change. Um, We'll also be posting all the presentations and all the resources um, into the onto the HSN website. So look out for that. Um, 
the recordings will be available at, uh, there too. Uh, and that leads me to thank you for attending today. We've had around about 130 people in the webinar, so really impressive. Great to give up your, your, your afternoon and great to have you engaging with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.